All right, it is 6.05, so um, I know there are more folks who had registered, uh, but they can just continue coming in as we go through this panel. Um, uh, I want to thank everyone for being here, for taking this time out of your Wednesday evening to both be on the panel and to participate as an attendee. Um, unfortunately, we will not be answering, uh, the panelists will not be answering questions from the chat. If you have general questions about GLSEN or need access to a resource or something like that, uh, one of the staff members can do our best to send you a link to that via the chat, uh, but we will not be doing a chat Q&A because we collected questions ahead of time during registration. Um, so with that, I thank you all for joining us and we're going to go ahead and get started with introductions. My name is Onyx Eva. I use they them pronouns. Um, I am the youth or yeah, I'm the youth programs associate at GLSEN and I will go ahead and pass it off to Lucia. Hi all, um, my name is Lucia Salazar Davidson. I'm 18 and a freshman at Moorpark College. I use they or any pronouns and I am the Freedom Fellow for the West Region. Thanks. Uh, Mary? Hi, I'm Mary Lou and my pronouns are she, her. I'm currently a senior in high school and I'm a part of Glenn's National Student Council. Thank you. Uh, Amanda? Hi, I'm Amanda. I am a high school senior. My pronouns are she, her, and I am also a member of the Glisten National Student Council. Awesome. Ollie? Hi, my name is Ollie. I'm a senior from Florida. My pronouns are they, them, and I'm a represent from the Southern Region and the National Student Council. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for joining us and sharing that little bit of information about yourselves. Um, so the first question is uh, how did you initially get involved in a GSA and what made you want to start or join one? And, oh, sorry, sorry, I forgot about our wonderful educator who is a part of this panel. <laughs> um, Christy, you are next, please introduce yourself. Thank you. It's okay. Hi, I'm Christy, uh, she, her pronouns. I am a GSA sponsor and also a principal within my district. And I'm a GLSEN educator committee. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so our first question is, how did you initially get involved in a GSA and what made you want to join or start one? And for me, I knew that I was sort of coming out into my identity as a queer person, figuring out who I was, what labels resonated with me, and I really wanted some queer friends in my life. Um, I wasn't interested in activism yet when I was getting involved in a GSA, uh, but I knew that I wanted a space to find other young LGBTQ plus people. And so I decided to start a GSA at my high school um, because I knew that GSAs were a great place to find uh, social networks, um, but my high school didn't have one at the time when I was a freshman. Um, so the search for friendship was really what brought me to a GSA. And we're going to switch up the order a little bit so we don't get too repetitive. Uh, let's go with Amanda. Uh, I kind of had a similar experience. Um, so I was like kind of coming into my identity as a queer person and I knew what GSAs were and I knew I was like in like eighth grade when I came out and I um, knew that the high school I was going to had a GSA. So I was so excited to join a GSA and it was amazing. And in my sophomore year, one of my advisors said, hey, you should run to be a GSA president. And I was like, what? And then I did. And I won. And it completely changed my life. I, you know, really came into myself as like a leader and as a queer person. And now I'm with Glisten and I do all these amazing things. I have all these great opportunities. So yeah, it was really great. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Mary. Yeah, so actually a lot of my friends were saying that they want to start a GSA, but um, somehow that idea never um, got pulled through. So I was like, okay, I'll start one. And actually the main event that triggered it was because um, there were like noticeably discrimination in my school towards queer students. And then I was like, okay, there need to be a space that's safe for queer students and for us to advocate for our rights. Absolutely. 
Yeah, so hearing these different perspectives, you know, GSAs are great for social environments, for advocacy, for leadership building. There are a lot of uh, really different benefits to being in a GSA, and every GSA is different. So some may lean more toward uh, being focused on social activity, some might lean more toward advocacy, but as a member of a GSA, you can do a lot of work to help shape your GSA to meet your needs, um, as well as the needs of other students. Uh, so now let's hear from Ali. Like the other people who have spoken, um, I definitely joined because at my middle school, we didn't have a GSA. I was essentially in all my classes, the only queer person. So I wasn't anticipating any advocacy or activism at all. I just joined because I was really excited that my high school had a GSA, my middle school did not. I just wanted to make more queer friends with similar perspectives, identities, life experiences to me. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Christy, what made you wanna get involved with the GSA? Um, there was a there was a teacher who uh, previously was running the GSA and she retired um, and I said hey I want this like I want to be involved and I also wanted to um, just do more with it and make it bigger and a little bit more organized and um, knew that this was a space that I wanted to be involved and help students so um, that's why I decided to get in get involved with it. So thank you and Lucia. Yeah, like a lot of the other panelists um, have said, there was no GSA at my school um, when I got to high school. Um, so I decided to start one because I was looking for a queer community. I was looking for queer friends um, and the couple of people who I knew and I banded together and put our GSA together. Um, so we would have a place to be together in that way. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing. We're going to talk more about the work that our GSAs do now. Um, so the next question is, in what ways does your GSA make an impact on your community? Is it a social space? Do you engage in advocacy? Do you provide education? Is there something else that your GSA focuses on? Uh, so for this one, we'll start with Christy. Uh, we really do all of these um, and in all capacities try to work with uh, within this. But one of the things that we have done uh, the most work in um, would be uh, working with our local university and getting an opportunity to um, uh, kind of work within college students also and create some um, involvement with them. And we've also gotten an opportunity to work with like our local um, mental health communities and um, our local shelters and trying to make sure that um, we bring panelists and speakers to come um, talk with our students. So we do we do probably uh, work within all of those capacities. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Ollie. We do a little bit of everything in terms of providing a social space and advocacy. Um, specifically, when we have our meetings, we often do presentations on queer history and culture. Actually, this month for Black History Month, we're doing a bunch of presentations on prominent Black queer figures like Bayard Rustin, Gladys Bentley, um, so that, you know, queer students can be in an affirming place, you know, where their history, um, they know that their history matters and they can learn about themselves. And a lot of the advocacy work is about um, improving conditions specifically within the school. So we've had walkouts for the recent Don't Say Gay bills. We've done a lot of negotiating with staff in terms of helping trans students with like name changes and such, um, being middlemen in order to improve the, improve the reporting system so that people, the students who are bullying queer students ha um, are being held accountable, teacher training for teachers to be better allies, stuff like that. Yeah, thank you. That's like a really diverse scope of work from you and Christy. A lot of like different types of work are happening in your GSAs in order to support the diverse needs of students. Um, next, let's hear from uh, Amanda. I totally agree that like um, trying to meet the needs of a lot of different students is like the most important thing. Um, so my GSA is mostly discussion based. Um, we talk a lot about like current events um, in order to like heal and process things together. 
Um, and my school is pretty diverse. So one of the things I love about my GSA is that since we all come from a different walk of life, we're able to not just educate people outside of the GSA, but educate each other and foster an understanding of intersectionality in our group. Um, just today, all of our meetings this month um, are about racial justice. And today we talked about decolonization and reparations and what that means to us as a group. Um, so stuff like that. We also share a lot of resources for how we can take care of our mental health and how we can be activists outside of the GSA itself. So like taking what we learn in GSA and applying it outside. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. And I think that expanding the work that your GSA does into your broader community, whether that's the community in your school or outside of your school, is a really great way to uh, have a greater impact, not just on the students who are in your GSA, but also all of the students around you who may not have a lot of access to education about, um, you know, about LGBTQ plus issues or about racial justice or disability justice or any of these different things. Um, Mary. Yeah, like Amanda mentioned, um, our GSA is definitely more discussion based, it's more of like a social platform for just students to hang out and chat. And but also we do a lot of bulletin boards, um, posters, like kind of more on an artistic side to kind of describe. We actually did a Zen library, which we did on queer liberation and queer history, and then we presented it in the library so students can be like authentic to themselves, share their own their own experiences, but also share something that they were interested in, and just like a little piece of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to the next question. Um, sorry, I lost my window. I always do this when I have multiple windows open and I can't find the questions. <laughs> uh, the next question is, uh, how do you engage with political issues in your GSA? Do you engage in direct action, send letters, provide a healing space, or something else? And this time, let's start with Ollie. Hi. Um, so our main forms of engagement, a lot of it I discussed before, we also um, we do a lot of educational efforts, like we've set up like booths, for example, for I think no name calling week to kind of like educate the broader school public about the importance of like respectful pronoun usage, use of like posters and stuff with a combination of direct action. So negotiating directly with higher administration, protests, um, as in like walkouts, et cetera. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Amanda. Um, so part of the thing with GSAs is that a lot of times it'll be the first like queer space that a student enters. So um, not everyone is necessarily comfortable with like, um, like big acts of um, uh, protests, stuff like that. So generally we just try to do what the group feels the most comfortable with. And um, a lot of that has to do with having a healing space and um, like learning about ways to engage in advocacy outside of our GSA time so that we can like learn together and then take that outside. We also like have events that the GSA puts on. Um, like uh, we had uh, a professional development recently, um, not super recently, like last year, but it feels recently to me, um, which was like really great. Um, so yeah, it's mostly like um, healing and processing slash like how can we like, um, we're very like solution based as well. Yeah, for sure. And I think that having kind of a multi-tiered approach is really important when you're working with, um, you know, a really diverse group of students. Not everyone in a school population is coming from the same background. They don't have the same life experiences. They don't share the same identities. So it's really important to find ways to ensure that you're being inclusive of all of those different identities and experiences within a GSA. Uh, how about you, Christy? Um, we've done all of these, but one of the, a, a couple of specific things we've done, we, um, my GSA members wrote a uh, proposal to our principal um, regarding bathrooms and trying to, um, you know, I, I like that part about 
thinking about like trying to find places for all of our students to have a, a role and it, that could look different for all of them. And so um, student, some students wanted to actually present the proposal and then others just wanted to be researchers or writers or people just that are preparing it and working together as a group. So um, we have written proposals, um, we've gone through training on how to talk to our legislators and how to write letters or emails. And then we're actually getting ready to take a group to um, our state capitol um, so that we can actually do um, meetings um, with them and then be part of that process. So um, we, we try and kind of provide those spaces for, for any students who would like to join us. Yeah, absolutely. And that's wonderful that you're going to the Capitol. I remember being like a baby activist, you know, my first time being in uh, state buildings of any kind. I got to visit Congress one time, which was super cool, uh, not through a GSA, but through other advocacy work. So I think that presenting those opportunities to students who, again, come from different backgrounds, might not know how to get access to a legislative body or anything like that um, is really wonderful. Um, so our next question comes from one of our registrants uh, and they had asked, how do you get your GSA members involved in fighting for queer issues? Um, because I think a lot of times it really can be kind of intimidating to go into activism. You don't know how it's going to be perceived by other people. You don't know if you might get bullied or ostracized because of it. Um, and so I'm curious about the ways that you create pathways to make it easier for members to be involved um, in fighting for these issues. So uh, let's start with Amanda. Um. You know, like I said, people have different comfort levels. So generally, I think it would be it's it's good advice to just um, do what the group is comfortable with, but also what your community needs. So um, what we've done in the past and also another thing is that members of a GSA are often really, really passionate about fighting for career issues, but it, they maybe just don't know where to start. So as a GSA um, leadership person, your main goal should just be to figure out like what can we do with our collective power. Um, what we've done is we've had our professional development, we got our unisex bathrooms open. It can be something, you know, huge, it can be something really small, but as long as um, the students in the GSA feel like they're making change, you are making change and you're empowering young leaders to, you know, keep it going. muted. Let's hear from Ollie next. I have found um, that students are very food motivated. Students will do anything if you give them, no, I'm, I'm only partially kidding. Um, definitely like Amanda and Christy have said that a lot of kids are initially unsure about or they have a lot of aspirations in terms of what they want to do and what they want to achieve as a part of a GSA, but don't quite know how to do it in execution. So definitely having competent leaders who can arrange for these events and then assigning roles from there is helpful. Like when we were doing some advocacy for No Name Calling Week, it was like the president and the sponsor who came up with the idea for posters and then students who wanted to contribute, but may have not been able to come up with that, that idea in the first place because they didn't quite know exactly what to do. They can help with posters and coming up with slogans and stuff and that's how they gain that experience. We also make sure that when we plan to have like some kind of event or program, we try to prepare them a few um, weeks in advance so that no matter what, especially if it's a kid's first experience with activism or like um, participating in activism as a queer person, that it's always gonna be intimidating no matter what you tell them. So making sure that they have ample time for questions and reassurances is, um, is also is always super helpful when they can work with their schedule. And, and, and to be honest, like offering food, candy, merch, it, it helps a lot. For sure. I remember one time in my GSA, um, some like a local restaurant like donated some pizza and we had like 60 people show up to the GSA meeting. Next week we didn't have food, maybe 10 people. Um, so food is Allies like appear and then disappear, you know, in thin air whenever there's food, you know? 
I also appear and disappear if there's food versus not food. So I kind of get it, <laughs> but Me too. definitely agree that uh, food is a really powerful motivator. And you can even do like a little snack potluck. Um, you can ask, you know, maybe say three students every week are going to bring in a snack and, you know, it can be a bag of chips or like store-bought cookies or, uh, I don't know, uh, soup. I, I don't know what other <laughs> snacks are. Um, we have a we have a little prize box for when students do good. Um, we reward them because um, Listen, who is so wonderful and kind, has given me a bunch of Listen merch that I get to now hand out to students. So that's, we're all five-year-olds here. Yes. Yeah. Um, incentivization is really important for getting people involved. Uh, Christy. I just love all of your ideas. Um, I mean, for my for my kids, for my GSA members, um, you know, I think it's really important as a sponsor to provide just a, a safe, comfortable avenue for any student who who might want to um, to really take up that fight. Um, but also, I kind of you know, I I want to also protect them and try to make sure that they're 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 put into safe safe places. And so, um, for example, we um, we fought back against our school board, and, uh, not our school board, but like having a chance to speak at our school board against some community members who were also speaking. And um, some of my GSA uh, students did, members did, did not feel comfortable like speaking at the board meeting, but they wanted to write. They wanted their message to be heard. So we found other people to read their messages out loud at the school board meeting. Um, and so just trying to be creative and finding different avenues for students um, who want to be involved, but um, maybe are, are unsure at different points you know, in, in their lives. So um, I think just providing a lot of different ways for them to, to showcase their leadership is important. We also had a chance for them to write a grant to get books, LGBTQ plus books for our book bus. And so having them be involved in something in the background um, to see that I think is also part of advocacy. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope that for our audience, all of these different approaches to getting students involved give you some ideas to think about implementing in your GSA. Um, you know, whether it's maybe there's a food day one day and then another time uh, it's a letter writing campaign where students can, you know, write anonymous letters to their representatives or something. Um, there are a lot of really diverse ways that students can be involved in activism and advocacy in their school or their broader community uh, through a GSA. Um, so next, uh, I'm going to let Christy start this one off. Our next question is, what traits make a good GSA advisor? And what advice would you give to folks who are currently in the process of finding an advisor? Um, I think you just have to be, you have to be patient. Um, but you also have to be very open and then also like tenacious, like just just putting, you know, like um, as a, as an advisor, you don't have to do it all the time, but you will be um, uh, have those moments where you you do need to put yourself out there and stick up for your students and do what's right for them and help them and guide them. And um, and so I think it's important to build relationships um, with the current principal of your building as a sponsor. I think that's really important to have that positive relationship with them. I think you also need to network, um, get out there, talk to other teachers, talk to other um, principals, um, the superintendent, um, the community members, and really try to provide um, a really good base to support your GSA and to support your members. Um, I think that's just one of the best things you can do as a sponsor is try to um, create that um, community for them, so. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that having a strong GSA advisor who will really like advocate for you and, you know, figure out how to work with school administration and help with logistics and things like that um, is super important to having a successful GSA. Uh, throughout my time in high school, I had five different GSA advisors and some of them were fantastic and some of them were less fantastic. Um, and there definitely was a difference in the culture of the club, depending on um, kind of the amount of dedication coming from an advisor. Uh, so now we'll hear from the students about what they think makes a good GSA advisor as well. And we'll start with Lucia. Yeah, um, I will say 
during my time um, as a GSA president, and I'm not currently in a GSA, um, but I was throughout all of high school. Um, and during my time as a GSA president, I will say that the greatest thing that um, I found with my GSA advisor was that he was someone who would really go to bat for you. Um, depending on how accepting your school is and how accepting your school administration is, it might be easier or harder for you to run your GSA. Um, and if you have an administration who may not be 100% on board with you and might give you some pushback, it's important to have a teacher who will not quit being sort of a thorn in the side of your um, less tolerant administration. So someone who will continue to fight for you is really important. So someone who is invested in the GSA and not just like a classroom for you to meet in. Um, I think that it's really important that GSA advisors are really passionate about the work. Um, I was lucky enough that my GSA advisor actually happened to be the only out gay teacher at my school. So we were lucky that we had someone who was within the community. That's not always going to be a possibility and it doesn't necessarily make you better or worse, but um, it was something I was grateful to have. Absolutely. And I think that there's also a sense of mentorship that happens um, between GSA students and the GSA advisor. Um, so especially if you can find an advisor who's been involved in the LGBTQ plus community for a long time, um, who's engaged in advocacy, maybe even with other issues or something, having that person who has lived experience working in various communities and advocating for people's rights um, can make a huge difference for students and for just letting them know um, that there are adults out there who can support them, who have done this work, um, and that it gives students someone to look up to and really uh, get a lot of like advice from. Um, so next, let's hear from Mary. Yeah, so like Christy mentioned, I think patience is like a very great quality or characteristic to have, but not only towards the students, but also towards themselves, because typically a GSA advisor are very passionate about what they do and they have this set goal for themselves. But having patience for themselves to work with the students and also allowing progress and small goals and benchmark meets, I think that's like a really good way to think about it. And definitely having this positive mindset thinking, like being very caring, reaching out to students, always being there for them. And I think it's also a like both way relationship. Students should also be very caring about advisors. I understand sometimes there are bad days or good days, but it's like both is like double relationship kind of like both ways. For sure. And I think that, you know, through my many GSA advisors that I had in high school, uh, something that I learned is that it's also important to find an advisor who has the capacity to be an advisor. Um, there might be someone who's really passionate, who really cares about the community, who wants the club to succeed. Um, but maybe, you know, they're teaching a full class schedule and have a lot of work to grade and are working a second job or, you know, whatever might be going on in their life. Um, and that person may not be the ideal advisor. They could be, uh, you know, a supportive staff member who comes to GSA meetings when they can. Um, but it's important to have an advisor that you can rely on uh, to stay on top of things if you need them to communicate with parents or administration or something like that. Um, because I think that, you know, it's not it's not fair to the club and it's not fair to the advisor themselves if they don't have the capacity to uh, take on this like extracurricular activity. Um, so next, let's hear from Amanda. Um, I am blessed to have some of the best GSA advisors I think exist in the world. Um, they seriously are just amazing. Um, I think it's really helpful to have someone who is um, semi like involved with the community and um, like has relationships around the school um, that is super helpful. And I think uh, something that's really important is a GSA advisor who understands that a GSA is supposed to be, um, you know, led by students for the benefit of the students. Um, I think some GSA advisors are very, very passionate, but sometimes they get caught up in trying to maybe do everything themselves. And while that might be super helpful, it's not necessarily building leadership. So I would say that, and also definitely someone who's like 
very passionate about those issues. And they don't necessarily have to be like a member of the LGBTQ community. I think that that's kind of like uh, a stereotype, I guess, that a GSA advisor should be part of it. Um, one of my GSA advisors is one of like, again, best person I've ever met, so, so helpful. Um, she is not a member of the community, but her kids are. Um, so just someone that has like stake in the stuff that we're doing is really important, but also someone who's um, can like kind of sit back and uh, advise, but not like do everything themselves. Absolutely. And it's important that the advisor has uh, trust in their students to know that, you know, students are very capable of learning and of doing advocacy and of you know, facilitating meetings and everything, and that the GSA advisor is really there to support student leadership and student advocacy. So that's definitely a really um, important point to keep in mind. And that's a question that you can ask uh, as you're looking for a potential GSA advisor. Um, you can say, you know, hey, uh, we really want this to be a student-led and student-centered club. In what ways do you think you can support students um, while still kind of taking a step back and not being at the center of everything that the GSA does? Um, and I think it's really important to have those in-depth conversations as you're choosing an advisor, um, because I think a good advisor would be thankful that you're asking them these questions and that you're being thorough and figuring out which person to choose. Um, and so, you know, you can conduct a little mini interview uh, with whoever you're considering to be your GSA advisor to determine whether they'd be a good fit. And uh, Ali. I agree with both you and Amanda. Um, obviously, someone who is dedicated has skin in the game. Generally, if your GSA is going to be more of a social healing space. It might not be a huge issue if the advisor is not as involved and is really more kind of like being an advisor as a favor to you. But if it's more that if you want to focus more on like advocacy and activism and stuff that requires higher staff involvement, then you have to anticipate that if you get that type of person, you're not going to get that much done because they might have three million other things to do. Um, also, as mentioned before, um, advisors who are good at helping with like organizing, communication, presenting, um, but knows when to get involved when the students need help, but also when to step back so they can build those leadership skills. Um, and especially, I think one of the most important, if not the most important, um, is obviously an advisor that is compassionate and understanding, but knows what they do what they don't know especially if they come from a position of privilege in one way or another and is willing to learn and pursue inclusivity and and center the students especially those with multiple marginalized identities um and as christy mentioned um courageousness you know there's almost inevitably going to be some kind of conflict or issue and you can't be be frightened and be deterred by that or else you know the students are not going to need the, uh, not going to get the help they need. Um, definitely, if you're interested in finding a GSA sponsor, try to scope out like immediately um, the type of teachers that are queer friendly, have their schedules relatively open, and you think would be willing to get involved and advocate and are dedicated to the cause. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for sharing your advice. And I hope that this advice is helpful both to students who are looking for an advisor and to any educators who are thinking of becoming an advisor or who are already advisors. Um, I think there's always ways that we can incorporate different uh, feedback and different approaches into the way that either you're advising a club or the way that your interactions with your club advisor are. Um, that was a weird sentence, but <laughs> hopefully that made sense. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next question. We're a little over halfway through our time now. Um, so our next question is, what advice do you have for new advisors who are starting or restarting GSAs in their schools? And we'll start with Mary. Yeah, so for me, like, I guess the biggest advice is don't let the number of students attending the meetings or the club affect you. People come and go, students, sometimes there's meetings that you have a lot of students and you get super happy and excited for the next meeting. And then the next meeting, there's barely any students. And that is very normal and common. And the purpose of GSA is not how many students attend the meetings, it's not how many students who join the club. It's more of providing the space 
the existence of GSA in the school itself, it's so meaningful and purposeful already. So don't have that number affect you and know your rights in school, know your resources, reach out when you need to. Like we mentioned before, maintain a great relationship with the school administrator, especially the principal. They come in very handy sometimes. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the degree of supportiveness of one school administration um, can make a really big difference in what your club is able to do um, and just your overall like well-being as a club. Um, I went through a couple of different principals uh, throughout my time in high school and I had one that was really supportive and we could like basically do whatever we wanted. If we wanted to throw a pride parade in the middle of lunch or something, she would have been like, sure, fine, whatever. And then the principal who came after her uh, decided that like we weren't allowed to have any rainbows up in the school. She just like straight up banned rainbows. Um, and so sometimes, you know, it's great to have a good relationship with your school administration if you can. But I also think it's important to know that if your school administration is resistant, um, it's not it's not your fault. Uh, it's not it's not always something that you can control. Um, but it also helps you build advocacy skills to figure out pathways to deal with that resistance. How can you push back against your administration? Can you get parents involved who are supportive, who want to like come talk to your principal or whoever's in charge of club activities? Um, can you get other students to sign a petition or something if your school administration is being resistant? Um, so I think that often the administration can seem like this like really scary body who's only there for disciplinary action action or whatever. Um, but I think that they can either be a really fantastic resource or they can be a barrier to success in your club. And you just have to figure out the best ways for you to navigate that. And I will pass it over to Amanda. I can't uh, like speak much to this because um, I did not start my GSA and my GSA was pretty active um, even through COVID. But I would say the most important thing is to not um, get dejected or upset if things don't work out um, because at the end of the day, GSAs save lives and they um, do a lot of great work to undo systemic oppression of students and they're just so important. So it, if, if things, if it's not like picture perfect, it's okay. Just like keep going because it is so, so important that there are GSAs available to students who need them. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Christy. Well, I think it's really important to think that you don't have to do it all at once. That, that you know, as a sponsor who's been doing this for a long time, but started off with a very small club but that was just kind of meeting every once in a while, to having regular meetings and activities that we're doing now, that 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 it'll get better to stick with it and and grow it and and also to just know that your students are gonna they're gonna be awesome and they're gonna step up and they're gonna be leaders and they're gonna just have these amazing moments that um, where they will maybe even discover something about themselves that they didn't even know and have opportunities to do because they're part of something bigger. And so um, it's just, uh, you know, to, to let your students lead, you know, you can help them, you can give them all the avenues and, and, and try to come up with creative ideas with them. Um, but then at the end of the day, being able to step back and let them do their thing. So um, I think that, that that's my, my biggest advice, especially for new, new GSAs. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Uh, we'll move to Lucia. Yeah, um, I will definitely agree that over my three years of running a GSA um, as the president of a GSA, definitely people come and people go, and that's completely okay. And I will find that whenever we threw big events, like I threw a pride prom, um, we had over like 150 students. And the most um, members we ever got to attend a regular club meeting was like maybe 30. So Events will bring people in and more people than you even imagined um, were even interested in anything related to GS GSAs will show up at your events. And as long as there is a club, that is a feeling of safety and a feeling of if something happens, I know where to go. So student interest will always be there. 
it may not always be super apparent to you, but it is always good that there exists a GSA in any given school. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important not to take the the meetings where maybe only two people show up, like don't take it personally. Maybe there was a big band practice that day that was mandatory and a bunch of your GSA members are in band. Maybe there was theater rehearsal. Like it's not always, it's almost never your fault when students don't show up uh, to a GSA meeting. Like people have a lot going on in their lives. Um, and so you know, it's important to just like see what's happening and then keep going. And you can still strategize on how to get more members. You know, maybe there's like a conflict that a lot of students have every week during your GSA meeting time. And so maybe you can think about changing your meeting time if you don't have a lot of students. Um, but at the end of the day, like people have other things going on in their lives and they're going to choose what to prioritize. And that's something that's outside of your control. Um, so you just have to focus on what you can control and the work and advocacy that you're able to do with the students who are present. And uh, let's have Ali go next. As everyone mentioned for the millionth time, you know, don't get too upset when, um, if slash when um, club participation is low, it it's nothing per it's nothing specific about GSA. It literally happens with every single club on school um, on school campus. A lot of kids join at the beginning. They realize that they have other commitments or that the time doesn't work out or whatever, and they attend in lesser numbers. These things happen. It's whatever. The way that I perceive it is that if even one queer student um feel safer and more comfortable than they would have without the GSA then you've done good work and well not that your work is done but you deserve to feel satisfied um what was I about to say sorry um make sure to like you if you're a little bit unsure about how to approach running a GSA exactly Glisten has a lot of great resources for ideas on what to do and yet yeah, shameless self-promotion um so that's always a good place to um, good place to get started. Uh, make sure to know your rights in terms of like having a GSA, um, which I might bring up later. Um, and I wanted to mention, I don't remember exactly who was talking about, uh, <laughs> good link. Um, I don't remember exactly who was talking about like working or I think it might've been Onyx. Yeah, it was Onyx. Um, with having like supporting versus non-supporting um, higher faculty. Um, but I did also want to emphasize that while connections and networking is, is often crucial to having certain events and achieving what you want, make sure that you don't sacrifice students and um, their ability to participate in the GSA for like the sake of compromise and networking. Um, one of the things that you can learn from a more resistant um, faculty, which is what I've, I've experienced, is that you can get really creative and, and you know, you can work with what you can. Um, like Onyx said, um, getting parents involved because often GSAs are becoming more and more limited in power with the um, a lot of the states that have like the parental rights at, um, kind of rhetoric. So getting parents involved in an advocate for GSA, that could be a real powerful, powerful thing. Out of school events, petitions, stuff like putting up posters, education within the club, you know, even shifting frames. Like if you did a lot of advocacy before, but maybe now because you don't have the ability to do so because of school regulations. You have to shift it more to a social club, a healing space, a discussion space. There's value in that too. You know, you just got to get creative. Yeah, absolutely. And your club will always change throughout the years as students come in and out. You might have different advisors, different administrators, um, different levels of support. Um, and so it's okay to just kind of you know, ride the wave and see how your club is going to change throughout your time uh, as a member of it. it uh, it'll always exist. It's not like this is like the knitting club or something, you know, where there's probably only like three people. Sorry to anyone in the knitting club, but. As a knitter, I am a little bit offended. But <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry, crotchety club. I also do that. Uh, <laughs> but no, it's totally fine. Yeah. And even if your club doesn't exist for a few years, like when I uh, started my club in high school, it had existed, but it died about like four years before I joined the school. Um, Same thing so, happened to me. Yeah, so it can start up again. It can ebb and flow and change throughout the years and that's totally okay. 
Um, so I know we're getting kind of close to our time. Uh, we're going to go to another audience question um, that is super related to this one. So how can you start or grow a GSA when it's difficult to maintain student interest? Do you have tips on recruiting students? And we'll start with Lucia. Um, I'm going to say it again. Events. Um, any kind of event, any kind of thing where and this is hard because sometimes I know as a former GSA president, it can be hard to get the funds for that kind of thing. But people love freebies. People love events with food. Um, people love events like that are a chance to sort of dress up and have a good time. I think all gay people love a, a chance to try to look. Um, so honestly, if you can get some kind of spirit day going, if you can get some kind of game with prizes, people like things to do. Um, and that's a great way to recruit. I know also a lot of schools have sort of club rush days or like club hello days. Um, and you can get sort of out in the quad and have like flags and stuff up. So really get attention and get um, people interested. Also putting out announcements um, over loudspeakers, if that's a thing that you're able to do. The more people that are aware of your club, the more people that will join. And I think that is a really valuable way to get um, student interest. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Promote yourself through every single way possible, like posters, flyers, stickers, uh, social media, have a website, do announcements, send it out in the school email, ask teachers to promote it, like to tell their classes about it, have a stand at lunchtime if your school lets you do that, like throw events, and, you know, make sure you do all, take a, a wide approach to um, sharing information about your club and getting the word out there. Um, Cause you know, maybe one student like sees a sign in the third floor bathroom at some point and then they know about GSA. Like people decide to join the club based on super random things. So you have to cast a really wide net uh, to get as many students involved as possible. Uh, next we'll hear from Mary. Yeah, ever advertising is like definitely key another thing I would say is like trying to make bonds with not just advisor like or but like students within students like um what sometimes we will do is that we'll like have all the chairs in a circle and then we'll have random question and we search online for a random question and have every member share their answer or they can pass but kind of just make this connection with each of the members and the students. And sometimes that bond also keeps students in, within the club, but also brings students, have their friends promote it for you instead of you having to promote it yourself. And then that just kind of free form like space is also really needed too. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Amanda next. Uh Everything Onyx said, like posters, PA announcements, if you have like a uh, student news, get on that. Um, social media is really great. Get the Remind app. So important. Best app in the world. Um, Ollie's shaking their head. They don't like Remind. Group me and Remind are both good. Yeah. Different reasons. How do you not like Remind, Ollie? I'm really curious now. They're both annoying. They're required by our school so that we always have to go through this this really ridiculous middleman and no one ever checks it. There are like a hundred people in our GSA group meet and like eight kids check the post. I swear to God, I love my GSA. I promise. Okay, understandable. For me, it works amazing, but totally get it. Um, Having a lot of events, also collaborate with other clubs. Um, This month we're having a collaborative event with the film club and the African American Trading Tomorrow group. Um, to like get everyone, if you get everyone in one room and tell them about what's going on, you'll get more members. Um, again, teenagers are so food motivated. They will literally, if you have pizza in a classroom, they will smell it and follow you and come into the classroom. So that, um, oh, what else was I going to say? Um, posters are great. Have a cute poster that has a rainbow on it. I mean, I feel like me, if I see a rainbow in public, my eyes just like lock to it. So yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, definitely like brightly colored posters are a great thing as opposed to just like Comic Sans text on a white 
cheat of paper, like make it fun. You know, you can have a club art day where everyone draws different posters that you can put up around the school or you can design them on a computer and print them out. Um, there are a lot of different ways to make your posters like colorful and eye-catching. And if your school has a large format printer, figure out who runs that and ask if you can use it so that you can make big posters and banners. Um, sometimes the school will make it you know, they'll have rules about how big your posters can be or whatever. Um, but definitely, if it's an option to have bigger posters than like a letter size sheet of paper, um, definitely take advantage of that. And next, we'll go to Christy. Uh, food, for sure. My kids love food. And so, but also like one way I've found out to, to feed everyone is also to have guest speakers. So like to have guest speakers and then they will bring food and provide food for our meetings. And so being able to invite them and then also trying to create some big events, like taking kids to the Capitol, um, being able to, um, we started like a, um, we worked with our local university to have a GSA leadership summit so that our kids could come and do workshops and then the university sponsored it. So they were able to pr provide um, money and support for it and, and to feed us that day and provide the, the rooms. And so trying to have some big events where um, all students can come and participate in those and um, they, to miss a day of school to go participate in something is also a, a, a way that I found to um, have a lot of kids uh, join us. So. Yeah, awesome. That's really cool having like a, a leadership summit or, you know, other kinds of like big events, um, especially if you get to miss school for them. I remember when I was in high school, I went to this like uh, parent teacher association, like day of action. I wasn't involved in the PTA, but I got to miss school. So, uh, you know, I went and it was a great experience. We went to the Capitol, uh, you know, did some tours and stuff. So definitely having opportunities like that is really great. Um, next, we'll go to Amanda. Did you already talk on this question? I was trying to keep track and then I didn't. I think I did. Okay, cool. Uh, Ollie. Hello. Um, in another act of shameless self-promotion, since a lot of people have mentioned before, you know, always have events, um, Listen has a really helpful yearly calendar with a bunch of like, rel um, relevant like holidays and events. So we'll usually do something around some of the um, the aforementioned dates, which keeps students engaged because there's something always a little bit different. If you're a GSA like me, um, both functions as a social space and as an advocacy um, space, make sure to like alternate between the two of them. So like you can do one thing preparing for some kind of um, event and then the next week have like a social club where they just get the opportunity to talk so that the kids, so you maintain um, attendance from kids with, um, with either or, or both interests. Um, when you're holding events, um, always remember that you don't necessarily, they don't necessarily have to be events that appeal just to queer students. I mean, I know that's obvious, but like, for example, we specifically had public forums where, um, a lot, or like the broader student population was specifically invited to come and discuss queer issues with queer students. We also had like family dinners, which wasn't even really specifically a, a, a queer thing, you know, it was just students got the opportunity to basically like use the kitchen um, for the culinary arts class. We made like spaghetti and cookies and then we all sat around and ate together. It was just something fun. Um, wasn't necessarily only like tangentially related to GSA, but that's a good way to get kids in who are allies, but don't necessarily have like an opening that they want to approach to join GSA or you know, people who are in free food because they might have a change of heart or they might know kids who are not just in for free food, so. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all so much for sharing that advice. Unfortunately, we can't get to all of our questions because we're uh, getting close to running out of time and I wanna be respectful of everyone's time and schedules. Um, so we're going to skip down to our last question, which is, do you have any advice for folks who are interested in starting or joining a GSA? And we'll start with Christy. Um, for me, I think it's just so important to know that um, uh, these students deserve one, they need one. So any any way that you can get a get a club started, it, it's it's just going to be necessary, and um, 
And so probably definitely looking at your district policies and um, ways that they already allow clubs, because if there are clubs allowed, then you should be able to have your club. And so you just need to look at those policies and, and, and go through that process and um, start talking to admin and, and just getting it going. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to Mary. Yeah, so I say for like starting a club, the hardest part is definitely to start the club. So once you get that done, you have that courage to do it. The courage to start the club is the hardest part. But once you have that done and you went through the process, you got approved, everything else is more of just figuring out and then finding your own pace and then finding your right fit. And if you're someone who's thinking of joining a GSA, please do. Like it is super rewarding for the presidents or leadership of GSAs to see new faces, people coming in and the advisors just feel really rewarding. And then it would just be a really good support of your community. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, next we'll do Amanda. I would just say, stay determined, stay on that grind because having a GSA could save a student's life and it probably will, and it will improve the school's climate and it'll be so, so important. Um, but also know that you can't take on everything. If you are in an extremely homophobic and transphobic school, you are not gonna be able to fix that all by yourself. Learn to work with other people, learn to delegate responsibilities. This is something I've gone through. When I started being a G GSA president, I was like, okay, I have to fix my school all by myself. That is not gonna happen. You need to learn to work with other people and you have to learn to network and trust other people. Um, and just know that by having a GSA, you're going to build your own leadership. And more importantly, you're going to build a leadership and understanding of other people. So just like my advice is just do it. It will be so great and it'll change the world. Just do it. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and then we'll have Ollie. This is more specifically for kids who are in states like Florida, where they have don't say gay or like equivalent bills that make um that may make you and the school nervous about the um the future of the gsa know your rights equal access to act of 1984 if they have any other non-academic club they have to let you have the gsa and you're supposed to have equal access to resources so if like the knitting club or the anime club or something stupid i will not stupid um but it's some, something like that they have access for example like the intercoms they also have to let you use the intercoms um it, it, definitely be aware of what you're getting into in that regard so that you know what you're allowed to do and you know the parameters so that you're less likely to back down even if you have um uh, if you have more wiggle room than you might have possibly anticipated you know the, the kid like amanda mentioned like christy mentioned the, the kids made it yeah, absolutely. Knowing your rights is super important, especially if you're facing resistance from your school. Um, you can say, you know, well, here's this law and I'm going to call the ACLU if you don't follow it. And most schools don't want a lawsuit. And yes, the ACLU even has a format for like a letter that you can send to the superintendent or your principal or whatever that pre that presents the argument, hey, this is the law, you legally need to allow us to have a GSA. If not, we're going to be taking further action. You know, it, it, a lot of these laws um, don't actually restrict um, as many rights as people anticipate. They're just meant to be vague and they're meant to be intimidating. So teachers and queer students scare themselves back into the closet. So don't let them allow, uh, don't let them allow yourself to do that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there are ways that you can get around resistance from your administration in a lot of different, uh, you know, through a lot of different mechanisms. Um, we are three minutes over our time, but I wanted to say thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, and does anyone have any final thoughts they would like to share very quickly in a concise manner? Just that I am so proud of everyone here for doing such amazing things. Thank you. And I think I saw a hand from Lucia. Yeah, same. It is so crucial and it can really make or break a lot of people's high school experiences to have that sort of support. So everyone who is either in a GSA, leading a GSA, or in any way involved is really doing something that you should be proud of. Absolutely. Yeah. Being in a GSA is a great way to have 
not only a community for yourself, but also to make an impact on other people, uh, which is why we believe that GSAs are so important for all students um, and especially LGBTQ plus students. So again, thank you all so much for joining us. I recommend to our participants that you check out the links that are in the chat. The first one is glisten.org slash GSA. It'll take you to our GSA page, which has all of our GSA resources, information about registering your GSA with Glisten, and uh, more information about Glisten. We also have two new resources that were just released for I Love My GSA Day yesterday, uh, one resource on building an, in building an inclusive GSA and another on starting a GSA. So we recommend that you check those out. Um, the next link in the chat goes to our school year calendar, where we have a bunch of LGBTQ plus awareness days, um, as well as racial justice and disability justice related events listed throughout the year. It also includes information about GLSEN's Days of Action. Um, and the last link is from the ACLU. It just is a little FAQ sheet about the Equal Access Act of 1984 and the ways that it protects different GSAs and different types of schools. Um, so if you want to check that out, feel free to do so as well. Uh, but with that, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to our amazing and wonderful panelists uh, for being here on a Wednesday night. Uh, for those of you in the NSC, enjoy the NSC meeting. And uh, yeah, that's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.